Hello, my name is Mordred Viking, and I'd like to welcome you to episode 2, no, episode 1, of this Let's Play Crusader Kings 2. This is, of course, the March of the Vikings mega campaign. In the last episode, we basically did the setup. We created our character, Mordred Viking of the House Viking Dynasty. He is a pretty decent fighter, but fairly rubbish at everything else. He's strong, he's a tough soldier, and he wants to go and break some skulls. Now, I did play a test game or two just so I could reacquaint myself with the mechanics and there is one thing which is severely going to screw us over but I do have ways around it. So as a Norse faction you produce most of your money by raiding stuff. Now ordinarily you would jump in ships, you'd go down the rivers and you would raid them that way. However we don't actually have any ships yet until the age of the Vikings which is in 863? or later. No, I think it's any time between 783 and 883. Something like that, anyway. Um, it's an event, it fires, and then when it fires, all Norse faith people, or is it Norse culture, one of those, get a free shipyard, at which point you can build ships and you can go raiding. Until then, you are limited to raiding your neighbours for money, so long as they are not the same religion as you. I think it's religion. You can check here. Germanic pagan. Rulers can raid infidel neighbours for loot. Now you'll notice that Gotland, it's an island, it doesn't actually have any neighbours. So in one of my test games I went over here into Finland, started raiding all of that and I wasn't getting any money and actually managed to bankrupt myself in the end because I had to pay for all the warriors. So we are going to have to play a little bit more of a diplomatic game than I had initially intended. And we are somewhat hamstrung, hamstrung in that we need to go to war every two years otherwise we suffer massive prestige penalties and Usually you get around that by raiding stuff, but we can't raid because we don't have ships and our neighbours are all Norse. But that's fine, it's just a little um, hurdle that we're going to have to overcome. First of all though, we do need to get rid of all these top icons, it's like the initial setup, uh, before you actually unpause the game. The first one, and most important, is selecting your council. So if we click on the Chancellor, you can then see the number of people that we have here in our court. We're actually pretty lucky, we do have a fairly decent uh, diplomat. So basically, your Chancellor uses diplomatic skill, your Marshal uses combat skill, your Steward uses uh, tr stewardship, Spy uses intrigue, and the Chaplain uses learning. So we're going to assign Torfin here. That weird symbol is kind of a T. Um, so yeah, you're going to be... Actually, it's Thor, it's TH, I think, so it's Thorfin. Our Marshal. Now, this is a slightly more difficult choice. Our Marshal... Top skill, our top combat skill in our kingdom, sorry, duchy, is, no, it is in fact a county, is eight. But this guy is actually a really good steward. So if we click here, it then sorts by stewarding, and he is still the top guy, and I kind of want him to be our steward, so we're going to pick him for that position. Uh, then the next one, level six, is actually really good at learning, and we probably want to have that high level of learning. Um, go into Chaplin. Also you will notice that we've finally got uh, Ingbjorg here because our religion allows women to be chaplains and our culture allows spy masters to be female as well as long as they're your relative. Oh no, it can be just female. So here we are actually going to get this 13 guy to be our chaplain which leaves the marshal... oh no there's one more. <laughs> this intrigue here is 14 and we do actually want someone who's fairly happy with us. So this 18 here, so 14, yeah, you're, you're actually a pretty good choice for Spymaster. Oh no, I screwed up. You were supposed to be the Marshal. Oh well. It does mean that our Marshal is going to be kind of rubbish, but he's also loyal, so we'll pick you to be our Marshal. <coughs> now, we have our uh, group here picked and each of them has a personality so we have four pragmatists and pragmatists basically will support anything that's good for themselves they're usually kind of seen as a more positive trait because as long as you can kind of sell a specific decision to be in their favor then they'll go along with it we also have a glory hound here which i have not had before glory hound counselor will always look sorry will always push for the realm to make prestigious advances for glory. They oppose attacking weak neighbours, but against more powerful opponents they will not care much for the reason of the war so long as it strengthens the realm. This counsellor also prefers a strong and centralised realm. Okay, 
and we'll read out the pragmatist just so we know. Pragmatist counselor will always aim for the path of least resistance when it comes to strengthening the realm and gaining power for themselves. They're inclined to support wars for reclaiming de jure land or counties, so uh, yeah, or counties with rulers' culture. They might also support wars against weak opponents. This counselor will oppose the creation of other strong vassals in the realm and will support the revoking of titles from already powerful vassals. Okay, so as I was mentioning, we in Gotland don't have any rivals, really. I mean, we can't raid stuff, so we kind of need to make other decisions. Now, Gotland is de jure in the Elster Gotland Dushy, and we can see that if we go to de jure Dushies and then hover over, it says in the tooltip, Joldum of Elster Gotland. The Oldham of Elster Gotland. So basically, our first goal will be to become the Duke of Elster Gotland so we can unite all of these uh, areas under ourselves. Unfortunately, the current Jarl of Elstergotland controls this, 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 and this, and this. So he has a much bigger army than us, but with a bit of wheeling and dealing, we might be able to manage it. So we are going to set ourselves up to do that. Um, court, council, positions. That's the one I wanted. So here we can choose what our inner council is going to be doing and the very first option that we want to do is fabricate a claim on Elstergaard land so off goes the Chancellor and he's going to start doing that. Next up we want to start training some troops so each councillor has three options what he can do so for example the Chancellor can improve diplomatic relations that means that the Lord there likes you more you can fabricate a claim and you can sow discontent because our Chancellor is actually pretty good I mean 13 is pretty high um, He's very good at doing this stuff, while our military guy, our marshal, is rubbish. So he's very likely to get the Noble Interferes uh, event, which is a negative. The top one's usually positive, the bottom one is negative. But we're still going to do it because we want a larger <coughs> levy. And levies are basically your tools for creating armies. You don't have, initially at least, a standing army. Instead you have levies which you raise in times of war, you fight the battles, War's finished, you disband the levies and you have no army again. That's just the way that the feudal system worked. Even though we're tribal and not actually feudal, we have the same system. Alright, our steward. You can settle tribe, you can oversee construction and you can build legend. Uh, settling tribe is basically allows you to export Norse culture to someone else. We can't do that right now because we don't have any non-Norse uh, territories which we ourselves own. Uh, overseas construction is kind of pointless because we have basically no money so we're not going to be doing much of that and then build legend allows us to increase our prestige prestige is extremely important in this game instead of it being on a rating of one sorry zero to 100 it's essentially a currency it can go from zero to like a hundred thousand and higher is better and allows you to do all kinds of things it raises your opinion with other rulers and things like that it's good plus the kind of score at the end of the game is your total prestige that your entire dynasty has earned over the entire course of the game so building that up a bit is not a bad thing okay spy master you are able to scheme build spy network or study technology so basically the spy network increases the chance that your plots will succeed I don't have any plots in mind right now, so we're not going to do that. And scheming means that you can find plots which your vassals are doing, but we have no vassals because there are no smaller territories under us. So instead we're going to do this, which is uh, study technology. And for that we need to go to the technology screen, and this looks a little bit different from EU4 or Crusader or um, Arts of Iron, but is actually pretty cool, because basically this models the spread of technology so if we select here we have light infantry technologies of light infantry everything in dark blue has basically no tech in this everything in uh, darker blue has a bit of tech and you can see these boxes are changing depending on where I'm hovering them over so here in uh, central and western Europe we have quite a lot of economic advances and quite a few culture advances and a few military well, over here in the kind of backward areas there is absolutely no technology whatsoever but if we go down here into constantinople we start seeing even more technology particularly if we hover over constantinople itself so what we want to do is we want to send our study technology guy to the place which is the most high technology in the world so we're going to send him to go and nick some technologies from constantinople cool 
And then finally we have our Seer, who honestly can't really do very much important stuff right now. We can build Zeal, which increases our piety, which is again another currency in much the way that Prestige is, but for religious-y type things. We can improve relations with local Godai, but again that's not important. I'll explain that in a minute. And then you can proselytize, which is basically converting people to your religion. We're already Norse, so that's irrelevant. So we're just going to build Zeal back at home. Alright, so what was I talking about with not having any lesser vassals? Here in the top box, that's the county level. But below that, you can also have baronies. You can't actually play as a baron in this game, but you do have lower level ba uh, baron vassals who you have to basically pander to. And you can build new holdings. So right now, these four places are empty. And this Gotland is relatively small, so the maximum counties you can have is four. Well, if we click on, say, Upland, there are five here because it's a bit of a bigger location. And then if we go to Paris, there's probably six. In fact, Paris has already got a number of baronies already built. You can see that's a city, you've got a Bisphoric, you've got a barony, another barony, and then another city. So depending on the type of vassal, also det determines their holding. So a mayor would have a city, a bishop would have a bisphoric, and then a baron would have a barony. And that also goes up through the ranks. So if we go to Köln, for example, the county level title here is a church. So he is actually a prince bishop rather than just a bishop, even though he does actually have a bisphoric under him too. And then the city is a uh, republic. So if we go to Venice, for example, do you actually start as a republic? You do. So Venice is at this stage already a republic. And that goes through the even higher titles like duchies and kingdoms. Is that true? Yeah, kingdoms, but not empires. Empires are always just straight empire. Right, so we are just the tribe at the moment. We're not even a baron, or we're not even a count. We're just a, a tribal chief. And we're on our own. We have no minor vassals. So improving relations with, for example, local godai, pointless. Right, next step. We need to choose a wife. We are already 48 years old. We are quite old because we started with the strong trait and the tough soldier trait. So we need to find a marriage. So now we're going to open this. And this is basically a list of eligible women in our uh, realm right now. None of them are particularly good. I mean, this one's 000 because she's a baby. She's zero years old. Uh, as people grow older, they do tend to get more stats as they accumulate more traits. And each trait will give you stats. So for example, this honest state trait for Gerda. Uh, minus two intrigue, plus three diplomacy, and same trait opinion plus five, opposite trait opinion, minus five. So if you're dishonest, then you're going to dislike honest people, basically. So my own strong trait is giving me plus two martial, plus one diplomacy, plus ten fertility, plus one health, plus one personal combat, plus ten attraction, plus five vassal opinion, plus ten tribal opinion. Tribes like strong people because, you know, you're keeping people in, in line. But that list of women was not particularly good. So we're actually going to go down here into the find characters. We're going to search the entire world for eligible um, bachelorettes to marry. We want someone of our own religion. We want someone of our culture and obviously a woman. Uh, they shouldn't already be married. And that basically gives us a much wider list of people that we can marry. Now, many of these do have um, down thumbs. That's the chance of them joining our court as opposed to them actually accepting an offer for betrothal. So most of these probably would join, particularly if they're only a courtier. If they're already like a seeress or something, and if they like their liege too much, then they would say no. Or maybe their liege needs to agree. And eventually um, we would be in a position where we can start getting um, daughters of counts and dukes, and maybe even marrying into a uh, ducal title if she, her husband died or something like that um, but right now we're gonna play genetics and we just want someone who has really really good stats so we're gonna sort here by combat so there's someone here with fairly decent stats 14 diplomacy 11 martial 20 stewarding 5 intrigue and 9 learning and that's important because your spouse gives you half of their stats onto your own so you see here these are actually our total stats this is increased because of our counsellors, so our counsellor give the whole stat? Yeah, the whole stat. So we have 6 plus 13 because our counsellor is 13, 
gives us a total trait of 19 and that's relevant when it comes to like ruling your own kingdom but not when it comes to personal interactions I think um, these women seem to be slightly different than the ones I had in my test game a minute. oh no no they're not so the best one that I found just to save going through all the numbers is this girl here Hala because she has the quick trait and quick gives you plus three to all stats which is amazing plus she's gregarious so she's very outgoing people like her she's cruel which is a negative um, however she is charitable and she is cynical but I quite like this I like I like her the only downside that she has is she's really poorly uh, educated but we're not after our education if we're being quite frank so we're going to right click on Hala we're going to go arrange marriage at which point we're now talking to her father which is this guy who is the chief of Burgundalhormur and he is the steward of Svetjot who is this uh, duchy up there and we are saying we're going to marry your daughter to ourselves now because he is lowborn he's not a noble and we are noble we will lose 100 prestige for doing this that's fine it really doesn't bother me that penalty will get bigger depending uh, the higher your own title so if I was an emperor trying to marry a lowborn it's probably going to be something like minus a thousand if it's even possible no it must be possible but you basically want to marry people as close in rank to yourself and if you can marry someone of a higher rank you actually gain prestige the other option here is matrilineal which is basically saying that we will be taking her dynasty rather than my dynasty for any children we have however we need more people of our dynasty. Remember, this whole game is about dynasties. We need to have kids so that our bloodline continues, so we're not going matrilineal. Uh, we're saying that the daughter, uh, sorry, that the father is going to agree to this match because he really likes us, apparently. So we're going to send that offer and then we're going to close that. So that's the marriage sorted and that will be uh, sent in in a moment. Next up, we need to choose a focus, and this is basically saying what we're going to focus on in the next five years. We're a big hardy fighter, so we want either war, which is plus three martial, or hunting, which is plus two martial, and more health. We're already quite old. We're already going kind of the health thing. We want to live a long life, so we're going to continue health. Besides, hunting seems a pretty decent pursuit for the strong Mordred of Gotland, so we're going to do that. And then the final choice that we need to make here is our ambition. Now, this is what we want to do in the future. So we have a paragon of virtue, which is basically saying we need to have at least 500 piety and then we will gain one learning and 100 piety if we do that plus um, Norse faith will get plus one moral authority but that's yeah it's nice but it's not really relevant to us or we can become exalted among men which means we actually get the uh, title the great um, that's one diplomacy and 100 prestige if we succeed in that but we need to get a thousand prestige and considering we're about to lose 80 prestige just for marrying a lowborn we don't really want to do that and then we have become the king of Sweden we're at lowly count. That's really unlikely because we'll have to fight Duke level people and it's going to upset everyone else who wants to become king. So we're not going to do that. See the realm prosper. That means we're not going to go to war for five years. That is a terrible combination with our if we lose prestige if we don't go to war for two years uh, thing. So we're not going to do that. Build a war chest. That has potential. I mean, if we amass 300 gold because we're a count, then we gain plus 10 national tax modifier, which isn't too shabby. But, like I said, we can't raid anything, and we ourselves are producing a poultry zero a month at the moment, so we're not doing that one. Which leaves groom and air, because we have no airs. This increases our fertility by 20%. Yeah, we kind of need to do that, so we can get some airs. Right then, that's that done. Council's in discontent, that's just because we're a new character. That'll go away soon enough. We're unmarried. That's going to be fixed. We can create a title. However, we need 200... No, we need 398 gold in order to create the uh, Duchy of Visby, because currently we're the county of Visby. Can't afford it. Irrelevant. We need to choose a successor. We're not going to do that until we actually get an heir. And it's telling us we have no dynasty. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, so we are now basically going to start actually playing the game and we're going to wait for our guy to finish the claim on our Scotland. No, we haven't actually finished. Because if you click on your holding, in fact, if you click on any holding, so for example, we can build a temple or build another tribal holding here, um, then you can build buildings within it. So this is basically just saying, I want a holding temple, boom. Once you have the temple, you can then click on that and you can build even more holdings. So if we go to... 
one of these with multiples, click on there and then you can see that they have individual buildings there as well. And there are different buildings depending on what type of holding you are. But we are going to choose our main county level and we can choose to either build a hill fort which increases our level levy size by 5% and our fort level by 0.25% which makes it harder to siege down or a market which increases our income by 05 we are not making any money right now, so having a market would be extremely useful. So we're going to spend our very limited resources on doing that. Okay, let's unpause the game and actually start things moving. We're going to go at a fairly brisk pace, uh, just because not much is going to happen in the early game. So, Hala and Mordred are getting married. We can choose to take 10 gold, because everyone's kind of celebrating, or we can take prestige instead. Like I've said, we are very low on money, and money is going to be extremely scarce, so we're going to take the cash and we're going to live in harmony forever and ever because we're awesome. Excellent! Okay, the next thing that we need to check on is the levies, which I mentioned earlier. You will notice that below the county fifth level thing here, we have several bars. The one on the left is the garrison. That number will never go down unless you actually get sieged, and it can only go up by building new stuff. So for example, if we build a war camp, I think part of that light infantry will go in the garrison, and part of it will go in the levy. Is that right? I think that's right. No. Training grounds increase the garrison size. I think these are just pure gar uh, levy increases. Uh, total number. So this one on the right is the one we want to look at. This is our levy. This is basically the troops that we raise whenever we press this button, and that is our army. So currently, we have 450 out of a possible 555 light infantry, 21 out of a possible 27 heavy infantry, and 90 out of a possible 111 archers. And that is um, increased by 10% because of our martial skill, and 50% because this is our capital, and because we are pagan. We're just going to let time pass until levy goes up sufficiently. Okay! My liege, the people of Constantinople have progressed beyond our own technological level. You don't say. I've managed to study their advancements and documents enclosed here should reach help us reach that level. I hope you'll find this to your satisfaction. So, our spy master in Constantinople is basically sending us documents uh, which uh, he has got while he's in Constantinople, which will either increase military, economic or cultural, and will increase the prosperity of our capital slightly. What the hell does that mean? Where is prosperity? Okay, I don't know what prosperity actually means. And the other thing we can look at here is technology. So you'll see we have 50 points in economic advances, and we can spend that on boosting the various levels. So once this is reaching more towards the end, we can then choose to spend the extra so currently, this would cost 106 to boost to finish that box. We only have 50, so we can't do it. However, technologies will rise on their own over time, and that is the spread of technology, which increases if you have neighbors of a certain tech, or if you are studying technology abroad. So because we are studying tech in Constantinople right now, we are actually gaining 15.4% castle infrastructure every year. So that means we're actually going to become kind of a a bastion of knowledge in this area because the AI doesn't tend to do this. This is a bit gamey, but it's one of those gamey things I don't mind so much because it just makes sense. You, you go to the most technological place if you want to study their tech. It, the less realistic thing is I'm in Gotland, Constantinople's all down, way down there. We probably don't even know it exists, but meh, bite me. Okay. My young wife has taken a passion for romantic poetry. She keeps reading any sort of romantic poetry she can get hold of. So we can get some more for her to read, so that will cost us 10 gold, but will increase her fertility by 10%, and she will gain the lustful trait, and she likes me more. Or I can choose to kind of ignore it, and I will gain piety. She will lose fertility, and she will lose opinion. I don't really want to spend the money, so sorry, dear. Do it yourself. <laughs> It's a bit too expensive to go and grab that. Okay, we're just waiting for time to pass so we can get this fabricated claim. We just have to wait. Claim 10% chance it's going to happen every year. Don't think there's anything to do.
Oh, except Voldemar has just died as our steward, which means we need to replace him. That's unfortunate because our steward was actually really strong. So instead we have this chap, Ivar. Now you'll see here, minus eight. He doesn't like us very much because he's envious. That will actually be fixed somewhat once we promote him to being a steward. And you can see that if we go here. So now he has plus two. Because he was given a title, he likes... Well, A, he actually is still envious. No, he wants to become the Count, so that's always going to be a negative minus 15. But he's increased um, opinion because we promoted him into Steward. And we still want him to build a legend. However, this is only 0 0.7 a month rather than 1.2 a month, which the previous one was doing. That difference is there because he is 5 points worse than the previous Steward, so we're actually going to be making less money as well, I think. Which is on fortunate. And he was also a pragmatist. The other thing we can do is give people minor titles. So for example we currently have two commanders, Nupa and Frederick, and if we click on that we can select other people to be the commander depending on their combat skill. However the best people are currently doing that. But there are other ones that we can also do. So we can designate someone our regent should we die, so they take over instead of us. Right now we don't want to do that. We can select someone to be the cupbearer, which increases their opinion of me, but I also have to pay them a salary. Um, <coughs> cupbearer is an interesting one. You only really want to give this to someone who already has a high opinion of you, because they can poison your drinks. I mean, they, in inverted commas, test your drinks before you drink them, but that also gives them the opportunity to slip a little something something in there. And then another one here is Law Speaker. Monthly salary of 0.1, however, increases their opinion by plus 10. So if Ivar, for example, had become my Spy Master, and the Spy Master puts him in a really good position to plot against me, as well as uncover other people trying to plot against me, which would be bad. So we would want to build Ivar's opinion up, and we can do that through titles like uh, make him the Law Master, but we probably don't want to make him the Spy Master, sorry, the uh, Cup Bearer, because that gives him an even higher chance, plus the chance of him being the Spy Master, to murder us. And he is envious and he wants our title, so that just kind of compounds the chances of him doing bad things. So. But as the steward, I'm really not too bothered if he likes me or not, so we're just going to ignore it. This chap, on the other hand, Stein, with his 42 opinion, is probably a pretty good choice for Regent if we needed a regent. Who's actually fighting here? You are fighting against Sigur of the Gatish. Right, so yeah, Sigur Ring is fighting people. He tends to do this because he's actually one of the first kings of Scotland. And there we go, we have our market village, which means we are now making a little bit of money, 0.15 a month. Marvellous. We'll close that, we'll close that. Okay, and then these guys have just raised their armies because they are now at war with Sigurd and their armies are fairly small so what we can actually do is we could go to Sigurd and say hey buddy do you want help in attacking these guys? Now the reason for that is Sigurd is a lot bigger than these guys are right now so if I buddy up to him he might be in a position to help me out in the future. So what we're going to do is we're going to offer to join war subjugation against these guys and he says yes he's likely to, to uh, accept that so we'll let a little bit of time pass to the strong chief Mordred blessings upon you and your house I gladly accept your offer of assistance in my war let us let our enemies tremble so he likes me because of this so we check this opinion of Mordred plus 31 join my war plus 15 so we are now going to here we're going to raise our levies we're raising our 700 men we're going to wait here for just a moment, because we can now see everything that Sigurd does, and he has a much bigger army. So we're going to wait until he's a bit closer. He's moving to Alstog Outland. And now he's moving to Chust, and so are we. We're going to go and join that fight. Let's slow this down so we can see a bit of how the fight actually takes place once we arrive. Boom. So we've now got 3,200 men fighting his 1,600. And combat in this is a little bit more in depth than say EU4, in that you have different tactics that you use, you have different uh, flanks, although it's still very hands-off. It's all down to the individual skill of your particular fighters. So currently... Oh, did I not assign a commander? I thought it was automatic. So right now we have Jarl Sigurd Ring 
in the center flank. His combat skill is 22, which is extremely high. This guy is an amazing general. Um, you can see the number of losses he suffered, the number of troops in each flank, the number of the type of troops on each flank, and then the tactic. And this is where it gets interesting. So a good commander will choose a tactic which counters the opposite. So his heavy infantry defense has increased, his heavy oh, and his archers attack has increased. So his heavy infantry, he has a lot of them, and he has a lot of archers. In fact, he's got mostly light infantry, but yeah, they have also got more defense. So that's fine. And he's fighting this guy who's a volley attack. And mostly his archers are going to improve. But it's probably not the best choice. He probably does want something like a shield wall. Because most of the fights in this era will be between infantry. So we'll let a bit of time pass. Ticking over. Okay, so these guys are both broken. So we are now chasing them down to try to kill them. And... Oh yeah, and these bars are the morale. So different flanks can actually retreat at different times. So we won that fight. Our side lost 130 men, theirs lost 487, or 83, and we can now pursue them, which we are going to do. I'm going to guess they're running this way just because of the direction that guy was facing. Anyway, that is the end of this episode. Um, sorry about all the kind of tutorial-y bits, it means it's going a little bit slower, but I promise you it will speed up as I have all of this stuff explained and we'll just kind of breeze through time. But we're getting a bit of action, we're, we're now involved in a war. So yeah, good stuff. If you are enjoying this, then please do hit that like button if you haven't done so already. Please do also consider subscribing. It really does tremendously help the uh, channel out and like introduces new people to the channel just through numbers, sheer weight of numbers, you know how search algorithms work. Um, if you have any tips or advice for me, then please do let me know in the comment section below. Uh, like I said in the previous episode, I am pretty new to a couple of the features in this. So for example, the ambitions and the uh, focuses, that's all pretty new to me. And also the fact I can't raid stuff yet. <laughs> Not used to that. Um, but we'll just need to wait 100 years or so until we get the uh, ships. And then we can start really getting into the meat of the game as Vikings. Until then we're kind of playing the more diplomatic game. And wheeling and dealing to get ourselves in a strong position. Thanks again for watching and I'll catch you next time. Goodbye.